My name is Anne-Marie Hunter, and I'm the Director of Safe Haven's Interfaith Partnership Against Domestic Violence and Elder Abuse. And we are delighted to welcome you to our 2021 webinar series on supporting victims and survivors of sexual and domestic violence who are faith affiliated. Today's presentation focuses on meeting the needs of Muslim survivors and victims, and I am delighted to welcome Dr. Denise Zia Berti, Executive Director of the Peaceful Families Project today. Uh, Denise has 25 years of experience and is a licensed doctoral level clinical psychologist. She does forensic psychology and trauma and has worked with refugees and survivors of war, domestic violence, and other related traumas. She has worked in Latin America, West Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, and is an international trainer in issues around mental health and trauma. Uh, so um, she's also a practicing Muslim and has a, I love her purpose, her purpose to enrich and enhance Muslim communities. So Denise, thank you so much for being here um, to present to us today. Um, this webinar series, um, I will give you more information at the end about other webinars in the series, but I just wanted to let you know that we are funded by the Office on Violence Against Women at the Department of Justice, and we are very grateful for their partnership and funding for this work. And with that, Denise, I'll hand it over to you and thank you so, so much. I'm really looking forward to this. Much, much thanks. Um, firstly, I do want to thank all of our participants. I know that on a an afternoon, on a Wednesday afternoon, it's hard to take time out of your busy schedule. So I want to thank you for your commitment, not only to learning more about my community, but also all of the work that you do on an everyday basis for all of the communities. I would also, of course, like to thank Safe Havens. I'm so excited about all of the, because I do work in a diverse uh, world, I'm so excited about all of the opportunities that they are offering to all of you in terms of really getting to know different communities and certainly faith-affiliated um, folks who may be looking for your services. So I'm excited about that. I will also pre-apologize. I am your, I am not the person who was on your advertisements and I am not the person who you're going to see um, on our introduction slide. Um, we had one of our board members um, who was supposed to be doing this evaluation and I heard this evaluation, this presentation, and she unfortunately is not feeling well. So you are getting me in. Dead. Um, for those of you who have ever driven a car that's not your own, um, working off of somebody else's uh, PowerPoint is a little uncomfortable, even though you understand where all the parts are. It's not quite yours. So I do ask for forgiveness in, in advance for any stumbling I might do, given that this is um, an, an amazing presentation, but not one that I that is that it came from my uh, came from my hand. So I will do my best with that. Um, and I will talk a minute about myself, and I'll give you two snapshots of my life in terms of giving you some ideas about the diversity within Muslim communities and also working with um, faith-based survivors and some of the things that motivate them. So I am a what we call a revert to uh, Islam. I have been in a Muslim community for over 16 years, so it's not a new thing for me. Um, we use the word revert because we, the belief in Islam is that we are all born with the knowledge of God and of one God, and some of us take other paths. Um, and then when we embrace Islam, we go back to that, na that natural setting, that, 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 that reboot of who we initially were. Um, my life is very diverse, and I don't, and I, and I talk about this not because I think that I am different, but because I believe where I am not different. So in my family, uh, we, I started out as a Latina um, in the world. Uh, my family of origin is from Guatemala. Um, we speak Spanish, and the, my, I was married, and the father of my, the all of my children, um, I have eight children, uh, five grandchildren, um, is uh, actually of Mayan descent. So when you start out with our family, and I want you to imagine, I was, I was actually imagining we went out to dinner, and this is like a real, this is a real story. We went out to dinner with a fair amount of our extended family. So our first family, the, our family of origin, is Latino. 
um, some Muslim, some Christian, some following Mayan beliefs, uh, Spanish speaking, English speaking, um, and then in terms of origin, Kanhawal and Kiche speaking. That was one side of the table. Then in the middle of the table were my nieces. I lived and worked um, and was married in West Africa. So in the middle part of our table, and that is where I actually um, became Muslim or, or started practicing as a Muslim. So in the middle of our table was my nieces um, who are African and African-American. Um, speaking French, Mandingo and Jula, um, which are uh, Muslim tribal languages uh, within West Africa from uh, Ivory Coast, and uh, and French, which is the current language of of, uh, of Ivory Coast, um, and who are so. And you can also imagine the shades. Um, one of whom was covered, one who, one of whom was not. And then at the end of the table was my extended family from Palestine. Um, speaking Arabic and English, um, and, uh, and a waiter coming up and trying to make sense of who, of all, who are all of these people. You know, at the table we were speaking four different languages along with the, the four supplemental languages. And to be honest, my, my, son, my youngest son and my niece are learning Japanese so that they can listen to anime and fight with each other in front of us, and we can't yell at them about what they're saying. So we have all of this going on at the table. And that is welcome to the world of Islam in the United States states um, in that all of those pieces are very uh, Muslim and all of those pieces fit together even though we are different religions and different, speaking different languages and are different colors and come from different cultures um, and that is what my family looks like. Um, as part of my journey, um, and I'll give you a second snapshot, as part of my journey, um, I was, in fact, married um, to a perpetrator of domestic violence for some amount of time. and. Uh, had to come to a point to leave that situation um, as a Muslim. And we'll talk a little bit about Islam and, and divorce and, uh, and protection and the beliefs of Islam. Um, but in, there was a moment that I w was talking to the head of the Muslim Women's Association um, of West Africa in Philadelphia. And she said to me things that probably no one else could have. She told me two things that were really essential in my path toward recovery from that situation. She told me, number one, what is happening in your house is not Islam, and the person in charge is not Allah. It is one man, and it is oppression. And in Islam, we do not believe in oppression, number one. The second thing she told me is, and it is your job to put an end to it, not for yourself only, but for all of the women who don't have the strength to do this. That is your job. So the idea was that she told me something that no other service provider could have told me, which was in my, in my deepest heart, this was not practicing my religion. And for those of you who work with many of our different survivors from, who come from not – who come from collective, what we call collective thought uh, communities, whereas you're doing this not for you, but you're doing it for your community. And to, both of those things were very, very important and essential to me as I m was able to move forward um, in my life from that, from that particular circumstance. So I want to talk a little bit about what Islam is, what a, a Muslims look like in the United States, what is the core of Islam and how really it can be used to serve your, your clients or your participants, but also how sometimes it can get in the way when it is misconstrued. I will talk to you quickly about Peaceful Families Project, of which I am the, the executive director. Peaceful Families Project, are, we are a national nonprofit um, here in the United States. We have a, a smaller staff of about five or six, and then we have trainers across the country. So we are national and local at the same time. We have um, folks in about uh, 20 different states across the United States. Um, we work in a different level um, than other organizations. We do not do direct services. We are, in fact, a prevention program. We look at training 
faith-based leaders, communities themselves um, through Islamically based theory, uh, not theories, Islamically based perspectives on domestic violence and resources. So we do trainings, we actually create resources for survivors and also for community members to be able to use Islam as a positive force in really the recovery from domestic violence and the prevention of um, within our communities. I invite you all to look at our website. We have an amazing sort of array of resources and a new uh, survival kit, which is an, um, an electronic virtual uh, manual for survivors of, tor of survivors of domestic violence, no matter what community that they might come from. So when we look at the, the, the story I told you about our, our dinner table um, is not different than the Muslim community at large here in the United States. The Muslim community is an extremely diverse linguistically, culturally, um, racially, ethnically, in every way that you can imagine. Um, and really, oops, I will double that back, really the only thing that maybe pins us together is our faith. And even within our faith, we may practice um, in different ways and we may prioritize faith in our decision making in different ways. So Muslims in the United States come from all over the world. There are 3.3 Muslims, uh, according to the Pew Foundation, um, which is about 1% of the U.S. population. And if it's, it's infected to double, um, one, because of the differential um, reproduction rates in, in immigrants and Muslim communities than within the general population, um, and because that it's, it's a relatively young community. Um, and I, I want to clear up some confusion maybe about sort of who, who Muslims are. Only 20% of Muslims are Arabs, but 90% of Arabs are Muslims. So this idea that, um, that Islam is a, comes from the Middle East actually is not correct. Um, the largest populations are in Indonesia, Pakistan, and India, um, which are Asian uh, countries, of course. Um, we do have 20 million Muslims in China. Um, and here in the United States, um, I want to, to give respect to our African-American roots. Um, Islam really started within the African-American community and was looked at because of the stances of Islam on racial justice and, in fact, um, uh, Feminism, and I say that word very cautiously because what I mean is is equal white rights of females within that, that that was looked at as a, um, it was a tradition of faith that had um, freedom and racial equality built into it, which is why it was adopted by many um, African Americans as the first Muslims within the United States that were, that were indigenous to the United States. Um, at the moment, it's, like I said, Islam is about 1% to 2% of the, the U.S. population. It is the most diverse faith group. So when you, when you hear the word Muslim, um, it is the one group where you, that almost means nothing in terms of race, um, ethnicity, language, um, anything other than following the tenets of Islam. 75% um, are immigrants or children of immigrants, and I would switch that around, and that means that 25, one quarter of our population are not. They are, um, uh, like I said, African Americans who were indigenous and brought, used Islam as part of their um, cultural expression. 82% um, are U.S. citizens, so um, including myself, and uh, that's important to remember um, when we talk about sort of this link that we have of Islam as foreign, as coming from another place. Um, and then there is the biggest number, I am not alone, the biggest number of new groups to Islam are um, within the Latino and uh, Central South America as well as Mexico and the Caribbean. Now when we talk about what a Muslim survivor or a Muslim victim of domestic violence is, as with every group that we work with, there is a complex amount of intersectionality in terms of our identity. So we are Muslim, but we are also doctors and lawyers and mothers, and um, we come from a certain 
age cohort we come from, a specific culture, we may have um, disabilities, we may have special abilities, we have all of those things going on. So hearing that you have, you know, when you get that file or you hear, you get that phone call and say, we're, we're getting a Muslim survivor, um, I, what I would ask you to remember, of course, is that's only one slice of who that person is. That's only one piece of who they are. So, and I do want you to think about, and I, 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 we have to do this in these days, um, unfortunately, because of the way that the media has portrayed Islam for the past, certainly for the past four or five years, but even before then, um, the, the images, when someone says the word Muslim or somebody says the word Islam, the images that come into your head, you know, women who are, you know, covered and in a burqa and, you know, terrorists and, uh, you know, maybe um, violence and all of those kinds of things. Um, and I would ask you to sort of put those images on hold for a minute as we talk about what Islam really looks like and what our core and tenant beliefs are. So I want to go through in a, in a quick way what some of the core tenets are of Islam. And, and again, with, I ask you to put on pause sort of your previous notions or what things you might have heard about what Islam believes. So the word Muslim actually means one who submits. Um, to God and that are followers of the religion of Islam, but that's all that that word means. Muslims uh, believe in all of the prophets of Judaism and Christianity, so Abraham and Jesus and Moses and Noah and all of those um, stories that you know from the Bible and from the Torah are also part of our religion. Um, they are all prophets in, um, in Islam. Um, the difference is in this next point in that Islam, uh, in Islam, we believe in one, in one God, and that, that is the word Allah, um, and that the last of those prophets are Muhammad, peace be upon him, our, our final prophet. So the idea is that we, uh, Islam built on the, onto, we were a renovation from the, uh, the original, what we call Abraham, Ibrahimic faiths, um, which are Christianity and Judaism. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we go on, but the Quran, which is our base, um, the base of our religion, um, really describes um, so many very clear directives around gender, adopt gender roles. Um, and uh, we'll, there are some other places as well, but the idea is that men and women are born of the same soul. So it wasn't even the idea of being women being born from the rib of man are not part of our religion. Our, our, in Islam, we believe that men and women are absolutely equal. They were made of the same soul that we are partners and um, the idea of marriage is that we are garments for one another, which means we protect and adorn um, each other. Um, and when we talk about what the role of what the goal of marriage is, actually, despite cultural misinterpretation, it is not to create homes, it is not even to create children and families. Um, the goal of marriage in the Quran is, is sikina, which is peace. The idea is that we were given each other to create sanctuary, to create peace for one another. Um, obviously, in Islam, the basic core tenet, which is repeated over and over and over again, is the oneness of God, the oneness of the spirit of creation. Um, that we, we are continuing the message of Judaism and Christianity. Um, the idea is that Allah has created us to worship him and to be his representatives on earth so that there is an expectation that we do good deeds, that we do good, we do goodness upon earth. Um, there is also um, a, a big part of our teaching is that each one of us are accountable um, to Allah, to, to God, for our own behavior. So it is not a husband or a wife. Um, or a father or a mother who can um, have any kind of obligation within religion, and we'll talk about that as well. But the idea is that we are each responsible. And in fact, there is a verse of the Quran that says to women specifically, you cannot hide under the, the wings of your husband. What you do is your decision, and how you follow your religion will be your 
will be your responsibility. Um, there is freedom to choose one's behavior. So there is also verses in the Quran that talk about in religion, there is no obligation. Um, so that each and every decision that we make, none of those can be forced. And if they are forced, they are not legitimate. Um, and then on the day of judgment, we will be held accountable for our own actions, not the actions of our husbands or our wives or our children or our parents. Um, the Quran uh, is our primary source of religion, and that is thought to be the direct word of God. We do have a set of hadith which are sayings and stories from the life of our prophet, peace be upon him. And those are in different stages of legitimacy, right? So they, those stories have to be authenticized um, or, or authenticated by very specific Islamic um, traditions and, uh, and knowledge. Um, and then we have the Sharia. There's a lot of confusion, I think, about this idea of Sharia. Sharia is, is a law above the law, which is to say these are the things that we are expected to do um, as Muslims. They don't really have to do with the law of the land, which is to say um, we are expected as, as Muslims to follow the law of the land of the countries that we are in and to be good citizens, Sharia is something different that is how we decide within our own beliefs what is right and what is wrong for us to do. And then in Muslim, um, Muslim majority countries, um, some, of, uh, some of which use Sharia to um, make determination between their own laws, um, and some of them do that better and some of them do that worse. Um, not different than any of our other faith traditions. The idea of Sharia is the preservation of life, the preservation of mental health, preservation of family, preservation of property, and preservation of our religious beliefs. When you come across um, Muslims who are, in fact, um, working through or working within con the context of domestic violence, there are some things that should be taken into consideration. So one is that we are all living in the context of the world of today. Um, and unfortunately for those of us who practice Islam, um, that includes um, a fair amount of Islamophobia from the world. So people thinking that they know who we are um, because of our beliefs. Um, and thinking that they know about us, about our families, about our beliefs, about our propensity to violence, about our uh, all of the above. Um, and that may or may not be true. And the other thing is that it really has created in many communities a feeling of um, unwelcome to the point of, of violence. Um, I was uh, last summer before Corona was at a conference and we looked at, um, some of you re may remember the, the Christchurch incident um, where um, three different mosques were bombed. Um, and we looked at the media presentation um, in Australia and New Zealand, which is where the, new, the, the person was from Australia but traveled to New Zealand. Um, and the fact that 82% of the stories of, of the word Islam were in the media the year previous in those countries. The word Islam was continually placed with the word radical or violent um, so that these things are not just words, they're not just feelings, but they really lead to um, actions against the community. And we're aware, as, as Muslims, we're aware that they exist. And especially when we're talking about Muslim women um, are possibly more easily to, um, to identify as, as Muslim if they are using hijab, if they do cover. Um, there's obviously, on top of that, increased hostility toward immigrants, especially in the past four years in the United States. And given that some of our, our survivors are also going to be not only Muslim but immigrants, um, being part of their context, and then um, state and community violence against black and brown communities, which also, so if we have people who are within those context that that is part of what they bring with them. And then you'll see the idea is that I would rather be in my own abusive situation than to be in a shelter because I don't know what's out there. And of course, unfortunately, perpetrators of domestic violence use that as well. How could you go and be with those non-
believers, you will not be accepted, you will not be welcomed, they will tell you to do things that are not within your religion. All of those kinds of things are very powerful weapons um, that a perpetrator of domestic violence might use against a victim, and unfortunately, those things may actually be true. Um, many of our shelters do not have um, the dietary um, options that Muslim women need. They do not um, provide the uh, religious support. They may um, put them in situations, again, where reporting and divorce may or may not be the best option for somebody, depending on their immigration status. Um, immigration stories for survivors who are both Muslim and immigrants, of course, are a big part of the story. One is knowing that those initial layers of trauma, you know, is the person in the United States by their own choice? Was there a history of trauma even before the domestic violence? What is the, what are the issues with acculturation in terms of language barriers? When we do language within the Muslim community, we're not talking even just about English, Spanish, um, and maybe French or maybe Chinese. We're talking, you know, 16, 17 different languages um, that may need to be represented. Um, there are conflicts in, in value. Um, cultural competency is not a, is not just a, you know, like, we'll eat shawarma and you eat tacos. There are real differences in the way that people view their obligations as um, family members, as community members uh, within their faith, um, and then gender roles. Although we will talk about gender roles in terms of the difference between culture and religion. Um, because there are pretty stark differences between what Islam says as a religion and what different cultures who practice Islam um, as their majority religion may or may not um, adhere to. Uh, we are going to, there is, when you talk about Muslim populations, there is a difference between religion and culture, right? So what is in, and that's probably true with most religious traditions, um, what people, what is written, what is the word of, of the faith tradition versus what is any given culture's interpretation of that may be very different. Now, both of those provide a lens that we interpret and, and interact with the world as individuals. Um, and individuals, again, are very different in terms of what they hold more dear. Is it, it you know, is it, am I working within a, a modern way of looking at things? Am I looking at my cultural traditions and upholding those? Am I looking at my faith tradition and what that says? Um, and they, within any individual, that, that cocktail, that, that mix may look different. Um, we do also know that there are contradictory values within maybe living in the United States, living with the ideas of your traditional um, family and the ideals of Islam as a religion. Um, and again, these, these are not always roadblocks. They are sometimes amazing resources, um, but they also may be for some folks an obstacle in terms of recovery. Um, and their service, their ability to seek and use services. Um, when we talk about barriers, um, unfortunately, again, as in every community, um, perpetrators of domestic violence, um, where there is a system, and there always is a system of power and control, will use whatever is in their hands to create that that illusion of power and control. So sometimes we know that text religious texts are taken out of context to justify spousal abuse. We know that there are misunderstanding of concepts. Um, one of our uh, beautiful concepts in Islam is called sabr. It's, it's patience, um, but that is not patience in the face of oppression. Um, so really understanding those differences. Um, and then, of course, there are also strengths. There is guidance and direct, um, direction. We do know that most Victims of trauma, domestic violence, and otherwise um, use spirituality as a way um, to move toward recovery. There is a source of comfort to know that, that there is a bigger creative force behind you, that is the, the, you know, the, the, the force of, of nature or of God. Um, there is, within Islam, very much a support of victims of injustice um, and a very clear it, uh, 
articulation that um, that Allah does not believe in oppression. Um, and there is accountability. That is one thing that is part of Islam is the idea that you name and um, and confront oppression, whether that be you know father, mother, or a governmental uh, force. Um, so when we look at ways that domestic violence may touch the lives of Muslim survivors, there can be um, mis the misuse of religious values, manipulation using religious texts, um, controlling or interfering with the individual's uh, religious obligations, um, and then using divorce um, as a control tactic. And I will, we will talk about divorce. Divorce is actually um, absolutely part of an Islamic uh, view of marriage. It is not considered a bad thing. In fact, our prophet, peace be upon him, was divorced um, himself. So there is not sort of necessarily, um, as with other faith traditions, um, the idea that divorce is wrong, however, culturally, within particular families or within particular communities, that might not be um, articulated in the same way. So when we talk about what does an Islamic family model look like, um, one, as we mentioned, men and women are created from a single soul. And the early work of Islam really was about protecting the rights of women. So one of the first things that happened is that within the area where Islam was created, there was um, infanticide of, of, um, of female children, the idea that they were not worth anything and they were frequently um, either killed or buried alive, and that was one of the first laws, the Sharia law, um, was the preservation of life, all life, um, so that people had very severe consequences if they did not take female life um, as precious and as treasured. Um, the second piece is that both men and women were created to worship God. So there isn't this idea that it is men's job to worship God or that they are morally superior. Um, it is very clear, and we have verse after verse after verse in the Quran that says, and men and women, and men and women, and men and women, um, and the idea that we are all believers, that we all have the same obligations and responsibilities in our worship to our God, um, and that we are all held by the same uh, judgment. Um, women are not considered less than morally or um, in any other way, um, that we are equally accountable to God and that we are only accountable to God. We are not accountable to, to neither our parents or our spouses. Um, and that, again, the goal that mercy, uh, marriage is based on mercy and compassion with the goal of tranquility, um, that there is also, the, the model of leadership in Islam is one of mutual consultation. So all of our leaders um, are supposed to work within groups of other believers in terms of creating what is a just system. There is um, gender equality. Uh, equity, which means we are not considered exactly the same as each other, um, but that we are uh, equal and of the same value, um, and that there are complementary roles that um, within. Now, again, part of that is because Islam, of course, was created in a very specific time and place um, where, you know, uh, the idea of taking care of children and those kinds of things um, were more frequently taken care of by women. Um, there is some beauty in that and that there is an obligation. So the idea that of uh, Islamic males being the head of the household, what that comes down to really is a financial responsibility that males are required to um, support their households financially, um, to provide housing and to provide food and to provide physical protection for their wives and children. If women work, it is by their own grace, by their own desire, and that they can help um, within economics, but they are not required to. Um, so a traditional family structure that you might see is that we have um, a father being the person who is uh, the economic uh, source of the family, um, 
who is considered the head of the household in terms of um, spirituality, maybe, um, stoicism, uh, decision-making. And again, those things tend to be more related to specific cultures, um, not necessarily written as part of our religious obligations or roles. Um, and that uh, mothers, you have this kind of traditional that are sort of more flexible, um, taking care of the home and taking care of the children. But again, that is not part of the religion, more part of the culture. Um, divorce in Islam, and I'm, I'm going to even uh, correct my the, the information on the slides. Divorce in Islam is considered legitimate um, and not necessarily after exhausting all other means. Obviously, it is not the goal of anyone to be divorced, but the idea is if you cannot be married and be peaceful, divorce is a positive open road that is given to us by Allah to be able to go forward and to create peace and love in our lives. Um, divorce is regulated to prevent, divorce along with many of the laws of Sharia are regulated to prevent injustice to either side, but especially to women, knowing that the cultural context of many women are in situations that are not just. So women, you, you'll see this frequently, women orphans and widows are particularly protected under the laws of Sharia um, and under the what is written in the Quran. Um, divorce is supposed to be peaceful. So uh, the verse says, if you can retain them with peace, do that. If not, you let them, you release them with peace and goodwill. Um, and there are two types of divorces, and we can talk about that um, as well. But the idea is that we follow the laws of divorce for the country that you are in. Um, divorce now in terms of cultural context may be discouraged and may be considered shameful, um, which can be utilized by perpetrators of domestic violence really um, to, to lord some power over, um, over victims or over survivors of, of violence. Um, there is a Islam is a family-based or collectively-based um, religious tradition so that it is not always comfortable for the, the idea of women living alone. Now, it's not prohibited, but it is um, for many families and in many um, communities not something that's considered desirable. So the idea of a divorce would would end up, especially if you're here without your family or if your family is not Muslim, that you would be living alone as a single woman or as a single woman with children might be a pressure. Um, and there are a lot of ways around that. Many women will go to live with brothers or sisters or go back to their parents' home, depending on where that is, or live in community with other women. The idea is that women should not be out on their own. And that is not all, that's not only because they are not capable or, of protecting themselves or they might do something bad, but really the idea is that families, that all of us um, work better within community. Um, there, of course, is difficulty if the abuser himself is well-respected or well-connected with, within the faith, faith community, and, and that's true, I think, of most of our communities and most of our faith traditions, what will people say, um, those kinds of things. There is the fear of losing the faith community, and that may be. Um, a lot of our uh, mosques are and religious communities are small and family-based. When you choose to leave a spouse, um, that, that is the, the difficulty of living within community, you may also lose their family, and you may lose um, your particular uh, connection to one mosque or, or religious community. Um, so that is something that, that women take seriously. The economic concerns, again, in the same as in, in many cultures, but especially if you are of the idea that uh, it was part of my job to stay at home and to take care of children, and now we have one, two, three, or four of those, um, and it was not in my expectation ever to work outside of the home. And there are some Muslim women, again, that that is their expectation and their desire. So when you talk about, you know, going out and getting a career, that may be something they may or might, may not desire. It's not part of their um, and their belief or their desire for themselves, and that does not mean they are oppressed. It, does, it just means that that is not what they determined was important for them.
them. Um, and that becomes an issue if we're talking about um, leaving and divorcing. Um, there may be immigration concerns. Obviously, um, uh, some people's uh, immigration status are tied to a perpetrator. Um, and then there also may be other kinds of um, immigration considerations um, around reporting somebody for domestic violence because it is what is called a, a moral, um, a crime of moral turpitude, which can get you into trouble um, within your immigration situation and also can be used um, against women. We see so many cases now where the VAWA regulations, which were created to protect um, immigrant women, now can be used. Um, against women where we have men declaring themselves victims of domestic violence when they may or may not be. Um, of course, the loss of support system and then the fear of, of losing children um, because a spouse may um, remarry, have, be better economically situated, or may have family support um, that is more than uh, the woman may have or the victim may have. When we talk about spiritual abuse, we're really talking about using spirituality and faith tradition um, in some way against the victim. Um, and that could be withholding divorce, um, really talking about ruining your reputation, especially for women who um, maybe were allowed to come to the United States or allowed to move to a different place because it was felt that being married would protect them from the bigger world and then what will happen with that. Um, for sexual relations during prohibited times or in prohibitive ways, which makes the woman feel guilty of um, sin. Um, polygamy in a country where it is illegal. Polygamy is a, is a much bigger uh, discussion that for another time and another day, what I will say is this, that Islam was the faith tradition that created rules around polygamy because it was um, something that was abused previously. So um, at that time, uh, and you can read this in the Bible and the Torah, um, it, polygamy was not unusual. Um, what the rules of Islam were to do was to control that so you couldn't be married to more than four women, that they had to be treated equally, um, and that it was pretty highly discouraged. The idea was if you cannot love and treat them equally in every way, then you shouldn't do it. Um, and that's where those laws came from um, in many countries, not only for Muslims but for other um, for other communities, polygamy is not against the law, and it is not necessarily part of divorce against women. The other thing within polygamy, um, in an Islamic tradition, the, the wives have to know and have to agree. Um, and uh, we that can be talked about it as another time, so it's not considered as part of a problem. But when you are in a country like the United States um, or Canada or some countries in Europe where polygamy is against the law, entering into polygamous relationships puts the woman at risk legally, um, and especially if there is immigration considerations as well. Um, uh, there is uh, interfering with religious practices, the ability of women to complete their religious obligations, um, either for, uh, you know, not allowing them to make the contributions that they need to make, not allowing them time to do their, uh, the prayers that they need to do, um, either forcing them to wear or not wear hijab, depending, um, which is always an individual choice. Um, enforcing, enf enforcing religion, um, and creating a sense of religious tyranny within a house, um, insulting religion if you are not from the same religion or if, you fr or if you're from different religious um, backgrounds within Islam, um, and then misusing scriptures, again, which is a common, unfortunately, tactic used by men of all faith traditions, who, uh, not men, perpetrators of domestic violence from all faith religions, or all faith traditions. Um, so how can advocates support Muslim survivors? And of course, the first thing is the same way that you support every survivor, um, offering them a, a safe place if they need it, offering them continual unconditional support, because we know that for women to leave a situation of domestic violence, it often takes, um, the last study I read was 12 times. Women don't leave all at once. They want to make sure that every They've done everything in their power to, 
to know that this is the only option open to them. So when we provide support, we have to provide that support on an ongoing basis and not based on what we think should happen. Um, we offer information, we offer guidance, we offer support, all of those kinds of things. Um, when it comes to spirituality, especially if you don't know um, about uh, their, their faith tradition, is to talk with them about it, is to use them as their own expert. You can ask if they need support. I wouldn't use the word help with spiritual concerns, but if they need support with their spiritual concerns, um, it might be helpful to let them talk about what those um, concerns might be. Um, use language and va that value statements that are familiar to them um, and allow them to determine their own goals. Now, I will say that there is a lot of fear within, because we um, Islam is, is frequently a marginalized um, religion within um, the United States right now, the idea is very strong that if you go to look for help, you are going to be pushed to report separate, divorce, um, get a career, um, and really change your intrinsic faith values. And women are really afraid of that. Um, that is something, again, that perpetrators use to keep them isolated and with their, their, within their own communities. And unfortunately, it is something that frequently does happen, um, where advocates really believe that um, this woman needs to be liberated. She needs to be liberated. She needs to be liberated from her faith. She needs to be liberated from her position as mother, as house, um, you know, as somebody working within the home. All of those kinds of things. Um, so I think that it's really important to work from where that woman is and what her values are. We do want to also use spiritual practice as a strength for survivors. Um, I know. In almost all of the women that I talk to internationally, independent of faith tradition, that having a faith tradition was one of the things that gave them the strength to go forward. So really, it's about helping them identify what is, what is the purpose of your life? Um, what are the practices that make you feel strong and that make you feel like you have support to move forward? Um, how do they help you? And how can we help to facilitate that if you are not in your home, if you are not in your community, if you don't have access? to the things that you usually use. Um, I do want to make very, very clear about um, the Islamic perspective of domestic violence. Domestic violence is considered a form of oppression, and oppression is completely unacceptable in Islam. Um, we do know, and that it is our job, it's interesting, um, in the Quran, what we are instructed to do is to not only help victims, but to confront oppressors, because the idea is that in that way we are helping them as well. We are helping them break the sin of, um, of oppression, of tyranny, of those kinds of things. Um, we know that it happens within our community, as it does within all communities and across ethnic groups. Um, we do know that within our communities, because a lot of times they are more isolated and because they're coming from a place where marriage, the, the definition of marriage and what abuse looks like may look different, again, not religiously, but in terms of community or country of origin, that there's um, a lack of awareness of the problem. We also know that um, survivors within our, our victims within our community are very hesitant even within our community to talk, talk about it. So it's our job to sort of stir up um, that conversation. Um, we do know that some of our cultures and countries tolerate um, or perpetuate norms that may either encourage or exacerbate the occurrence of domestic violence, and we work within our own communities around those issues. Um, and then we also know that within our religious tradition, there is no excuse because it is very clear um, religiously that each individual is responsible for their own choices um, so that we cannot go back then and blame our, uh, our religious tradition um, or our cultures um, that we are all should uh, take responsibility for our actions, including when that in um, involves violence against someone in our family. Um, and it looks like that was 
relatively good timing. We did want to leave um, some space for questions and conversation such that we can do in a place that is virtual. Um, so I will uh, leave that open um, and give folks a chance to either in the public um, in the public space to give us some questions. While we're waiting, Denise, I'm wondering if I can jump in with a question. Absolutely. <laughs> this is Anne Marie again. Um, if the choice were to, um, let's say, for the for the purpose of saving my own life, if I felt that I needed to go to a shelter, but that shelter could not or would not provide, say, halal meat or um, things of that nature, would a um, Muslim faith leader encourage me to save my own life? Or um, yeah, you know, absolutely. Like, and in fact, we've done a balance. lot. Exactly. We've done a lot of work with our faith leaders um, because there have been some, some, you know, horrific things that have happened within our community. Um, so those, certainly those who are trained by us would, be, would tell you that safety is absolutely first, safety of you and your children. Um, things like halal meat, there are options in terms of eating vegetarian, um, you know, doing other kinds of things. Um, as long as the person, and I don't think it's a, it's, necessarily about those small things, but how safe the person felt within the community um, themselves and their children, right? Um, so it would never be about those kind of small issues, although I would also say that if you want to create a safe space that is comfortable for all women, you know, there are things that you can do that makes that easier. And one is the, um, so uh, part of that is, diet, um, it, time and place for um, for religious prayers and understanding. We have um, issues around um, cleanliness um, and things like that, where if women can be given a space to themselves, um, that they can meet some of those needs in a good way. But for sure, um, and there are, there's also, um, scripture within the Quran that says it. So if you are, if you have no other choice, you know, you eat things that are, are not, uh, that are not halal. If you have no other choice, um, you can take off your hijab um, as a way of self-protecting. Um, Islam is beautiful in, in that way in that, you know, the story is that um, when uh, our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went to went to Allah and was given instructions about what Muslims were supposed to do. Um, the initial, uh, you know, the initial requests were very stringent. You know, you should pray a hundred times a day. Um, and our Prophet went back four times and said, wait a second, this is too much for my people. Um, so in everything that we do, there is this belief that Allah is trying to make our lives easier, uh, that, our, that Allah is trying to make our lives more joyful and blessed, so that there is um, wiggle room when your life is in danger that you do what you need to do. And that is not considered going outside of the religion. Um. Uh, we um, we just did the first webinar in this series about working with survivors who are faith affiliated, and one of the things we're arguing, this is Safe Havens arguing, is that domestic violence strips so many parts of your identity away that if there's any way that shelters or service providers could help or support faith-affiliated survivors to hang on to parts of their faith or all of their faith, that it counteracts the way that it, it counteracts the abuse, um, which is trying to strip everything away from you. So thank Absolutely. You and especially because perpetrators of domestic violence frequently use that, right? Exactly. It's me and yeah. God 
or you and, and you know and and being you know uh, you know an unfaithful person um, for me I will talk some uh, of my own story when I chose to leave the perpetrator of domestic violence who happened to be Muslim. That is not why he was a perpetrator of, of domestic violence. But everyone thought, my, my Christian family, everyone thought that I would leave Islam. And at that point, Islam was the only thing that held me together. Mm. It was the mm-hmm. only thing that I had. Um, right. And I and I had to explain to them that it's it, first of all it this had nothing to do with Islam. This had to do with this individual um, who is not God or a representation or a good representation of his religion. But that 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 I could not. That was the only thing that that made sense to me. It was the only thing that held my my sanity. And I was actually just reading um, uh, the. Um, the wife of Malcolm X, who was one of the the first um, Muslim leaders in the United States, and you have diff- you may have different opinions of him or not, but that's also what happened with her. So she had been a convert, um, and when he was assassinated, not very far into their marriage, um, the thing that she clung to was Islam. The thing, and she never mm-hmm. married again, and she remained uh, a faithful Muslim throughout her life. So mm-hmm. I think when we look at faith. It is, in fact, one of the things that women use to hold themselves together. And it's almost like a human right. Like, you don't have the right to take away my faith in God just because you were a terrible, horrible human being, right? That had nothing to do with God. That had nothing to do with my faith. And I think that it's so important for advocates to realize that, that women are not clinging to faith because it's, um, antiquated or because it's going to hurt them. Women cling to faith because it is a healer um, within that very traumatic event of losing your home, your marriage, your, you know, maybe your connection to other kinds of things. Yes. And, and we're arguing as well that when scriptures or a faith tradition have been misused or weaponized against you, um, that you may later um, re-look at some of that, um, unpack some of that, so to speak, whatever your faith tradition is. But in the moment of crisis, is not the time to tell someone to change their faith or give up their faith or <laughs> anything like that. Like, uh, we Absolutely. Need, we need the faith. And so throwing it over at that moment is probably not going to happen. Maybe 10 years later, someone begins to, we look at scriptures that we use or exactly and i think there is right absolutely and i do think there there does come just like you get a new house and you get a you reclaim for from my point of view and, and like i said i can talk to especially um reverts um which we do have who came to a religion because of a specific individual male. Um, and for me, part of my, a big part of my recovery was taking that religion back and making it my own. Um, mm-hmm. And I did that by moving to Palestine and living there for six years and really, really knowing that this religion that I had picked, this faith tradition that I had picked, was so much more than I had been educated in through a perpetrator of domestic violence. So it really was, and that was a huge piece of becoming myself, was taking that and saying, no, 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 no. You don't get to own Islam. Islam is not yours um, to really be able to inhabit an Islam, Mm -hmm. a faith space, and make it um, my own. Thank you so much for that, Denise. I think it doesn't get any better than that. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not seeing... Any I'm questions? not seeing any other questions either. Oh, Katie. Um, Katie, there is my maybe. right. Um, well, I do see there is my information up there, and then I will uh, turn it over to you to talk about your other amazing webinars. If folks have questions or concerns, if I would absolutely invite you all to go to our website because we have online resources that are very easily accessible. We have a very um, young and amazing communications team that make everything virtual and accessible. Um, we do have uh, 
resources in other languages. Um, so I would invite everyone to do that. And then if you have specific needs, absolutely to talk with us um, and to reach out so that we can provide any kind of assistance you might need. Thank you. And I, I will say, from the standpoint of Safe Havens, that Peaceful Families Project has been one of our colleague and partner agencies for many, many years. And we have the highest regard for their resources and actually use their training videos and all that all the time. So thank you, thank you, thank you <laughs> for the work that you're doing in the community. Um, we really appreciate it and have such respect for what you're doing. Um, we have some upcoming webinars and the link to sign up for these um, is in the chat box. So please help yourself. And um, oh, and Darlene is asking if we will be sending a certificate for the class. Um, and I'm hoping Allison can answer that in the chat box or unmute herself and, oh, Allison did. If you're interested in the certificate, please be sure to complete the evaluation, which is in the chat box. Thank you. So yes, the evaluation is in the chat box. Please, 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 please um, complete that. We live for data and we love data and um, are really um, wanting to make sure that all of our technical assistance is as effective as possible. So please do that. Take a look at this list of wonderful upcoming webinars. We hope to see many of you. And um, thank you all for being here. What a wonderful conversation. Denise, thank you one last time. And um, with that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you as well.